Okay. Um, you know, for a long time, for several years now, there's been a drumbeat of data, data, data to bring new users to the platform. And um, I've actually been of a contrary opinion now for a while that most users have their own data sets that they would like to see analyzed and deposited and stored and integrated within their organizations. And that the, the magnet for user attraction to the platform is really uh, functionality. And I'm a geneticist by training, <clears throat> although I've been working as a data scientist now for a number of years. Um, my colleagues have <clears throat> long looked at Transmart longingly, but with some disdain because its handling of variants um, has been lagging. Okay, we're, we're, we're more than a decade, I would say, clearly more than a decade now into the age of whole genome sequencing and exome sequencing. Variants are becoming a much more important part of the biological landscape. And although Transmart has had good facility with gene expression profiling for a number of years, it's only recently in the last couple of years with the integration of a genome browser and um, the ability to handle uh, VCF files on upload fairly routinely, um, and more recently with um, the GWAS visualizations that have been developed um, with, at Pfizer and, and uh, have been adopted. Recently, we've seen some reason for hope in um, expanding the toolkit for people who have variants as their primary source of data. Um, one, um, so, so this has been something that I've been after for a couple of years now, and, and GWAS in particular <clears throat> in recent years has really had some big wins um, as a tool. You know, back uh, maybe 15 years ago, GWAS was touted as having a lot of promise for being able to uh, lead to the identification of rare alleles that underlie common conditions like schizophrenia and Parkin uh, not Parkinson's disease, maybe so much, but schizophrenia, multiple sclerosis, autism, complex disorders like that. Uh, and there were quite a few, uh, and, and the reality, what turned out to be the case was, although GWAS could point you in the right direction, it had a hard time bridging that last mile, getting down to um, the actual allele, which is uh, risk associated. And, um, but that's actually beginning to change. With the very large GWAS data sets, now people are running case control studies in excess of 70 or 100,000 subjects. We're beginning to get the kind of statistical power you need to get down to the allele. Um, and so GWAS, I think, is going to enter sort of an area, an era of resurgence um, now that people understand what, how, how the studies need to be designed and analyzed. So I'm going to uh, review a little bit about what GWAS is, because um, we may not all be familiar with the workflow, and then talk a little bit about why um, I think Transmart is a, uh, has something to bring to the table for geneticists, and it really does. And that, you know, the preview is here. When you do a GWAS data set, what you're doing is you're collecting, you know, one set of genotyping information about a population, but then you can repeatedly interrogate that um, that data set with hundreds of different hypotheses. And that ability to create a hypothesis and parse the data set aligns very nicely with the Transmart facility for making clinical cohorts and subset formation. And so there's a way in which the Transmart interface can facilitate the GWAS workflow in the genetics lab. Um, then I'll just review some of the implementation details that we've developed and give you some examples. Okay, so uh, GWAS, of course, is a genome-wide association study. It's a sort of a research design. Um, the basic approach is that uh, given a large set of variants and a phenotype of interest, you enrich those variants, uh, you, you, you sort those variants by the, the degree to which one allele or another is enriched in your case control uh, population. Okay, and you can do this for multiple phenotypes given a, a, a single biological sample. It's kind of like marker selection, right? We've had the marker selection workflow in Transmart for a long time. They're both asking fundamentally the same question, just using a different data type. And, um, right, so, and you can see that when you look at the output of the marker selection workflow in Transmart and the Plink. Uh, 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 workflow output, they're basically the same table. They're, they're talking about different things. In the top table, you have a probe ID and a gene that it may be associated with. In the bottom table, you have an RS ID or a SNP ID and a chromosome position and base pair. Uh, in the top table, you have a statistic, the T statistic, 
which shows you, you know, how enriched uh, that probe is. And in the bottom table, you have a chi-square statistic. Uh, there are probability uh, sets in both tables on which the tables are sorted in this case. And you've got an effect size, um, you know, the log fold change or the odds ratio. It's essentially the same data, just using a different data source. So what does GWAS address in the, the variant space? Well, it addresses this bottom right corner of this space where we look at allele frequency versus effect size. You know, at the top, you've got the highly penetrant mutations, things like cystic fibrosis. Um, some of the alleles are common, like the APOE4 uh, allele, which is a risk uh, factor for the development of Alzheimer's. Um, the so, you know, the area at the top of the table is the provenance of pedigrees and classic genetics. The area at the bottom of the table is really where we're interested in identifying genes, which is, uh, you know, relatively common alleles in a population which provide some risk for the development of, um, uh, some risk for the development of a particular condition. And how far you can in, invade into the left side of this table really depends on the sample size that you're using in your analysis. And, and we're really into the stage now where the powerful GWAS experiments being run at uh, the scale of working groups associated with NIH disease um, diseases are on the order of 100,000 or more subjects. Okay, so the, simp the GWAS design is pretty simple. Uh, it's a lot like what we thought about, like my description of marker selection workflows in Transmart. Uh, the classic is a case control workflow where you identify a population at risk or that is somehow distinguished from its control. This could be drug uh, predisposition. You could do this on some sort of pharmacodynamic um, uh, efficacy. You could do it um, uh, disease state, uh, however you want, gender, age, any variable that you can make groups out of. Uh, you can also use a continuous phenotype and do a sort of a linear regression rather than a logistic regression. Um, and uh, you look at alleles, okay? And, and for each allele, you, you just basically count the allele in the uh, case population, the control population, and you do a, uh, a you know, a, a t-test or what have you. And you get a p-value. And you just repeat this. The reason it's a genome-wide association study is that you repeat it for SNPs that are um, uh, distributed across the genome in a, a more or less as, pos as much as possible random fashion. Of course, if you do this, you have to correct all these p-values for multiple comparisons, but um, it still uh, is capable of identifying alleles that are strongly associated with disease state. Um, okay, so what does data look like in the SNP world? Um, well, data is derived from SNP array technology, or it has been classically. Um, you know, the Illumina, SNP chips, and Affymetrix, uh, Agilent, and other companies have made um, arrays that specifically interrogate up to a million genotypes. Uh, imputation is common, so you'll find that SNP data sets often have five or 10 million alleles associated with them. Um, those, most of those m might be imputed from the characteristics of alleles that are uh, SNPs that are close together in the genome. Um, since we're doing a lot of whole genome sequencing these days, a lot of SNP data sets are actually uh, formed from FASTQ or uh, VCF files. So you can take those uh, data types as input into bioinformatic workflows and generate um, uh, GWAS data sets that are amenable for this kind of analysis. The format of the data comes in two flavors. Uh, historically, the ASCII text file was developed first. It's the easiest to understand. It's two files. The map file is kind of like the platform file for variants. It contains a sort of SNP ID index list of information about each variant, where it is, what chromosome it's on, its genetic position, what have you. And the PED file uh, is where um, the genotypes are stored. And the PED file has six service rows, which are IDs, basically, the family ID, the subject ID, paternal and maternal IDs, because a lot, because you can do triad genetics as well. Um, along with gender and case control status. So that's the first six columns of the PED file, and then there will be a million or 10 million columns, each of which corresponds to one SNP. Um, for various reasons, uh, the ASCII files have been more or less deprecated in favor of binary files, both in terms of space conservation, because these are fairly large data sets, but also in terms of performance. Um, the uh, Plink tools have been uh, optimized to do bit level uh, computation on the binary files, and it's much, much faster. Even a, a study with 
five or 6,000 subjects run in Transmart takes, you know, a minute or two to execute. So this is, performance is fast. That's, you know, one of the concerns people have when you stop start talking about 70,000 or 100,000 genotypes uh, has to do with performance and whether or not the system will bog down. Uh, this, the way we've got this set up here, uh, performance is not an issue. It scales more or less linearly with subject number. Um, okay, so what, what does the binary file look like? Well, the map file gets converted just straight off uh, into a binary form. The PED file gets split into two files. The, the, the genotype information gets converted to binary. So all of the rows that are not the service columns get extracted and transformed into a binary file format. And then this new FAM file is basically the six service rows from the PED file containing sort of subject level information and identifiers. And that remains plain text. And this turns out to be kind of handy for our implementation in Transmart. And then the platform, which everyone who an analyzes GWAS data uses really, is uh, Plink. Not Plink, it's one syllable, Plink. Uh, the FAM file is flexible. So it's a text file. As I said, it has these six service columns, but uh, you can edit it and you can swap out whatever phenotype you want into the sixth row. As I said, you can do logistic regression with case control, so you could turn these all into ones and zeros for case control, or you can use a continuous scalar variable like this one. This is peak temperature, um, and uh, this corresponds, you know, so this would be a linear regression analysis. Um, you can remove various columns, uh, you know, the family ID and the paternal maternal ID. If there are no family relationships, then all these three columns are, are unimportant. And so there's the no fam and no parents um, flags that you can run with Plank, and that basically gets rid of those variables. And this is now beginning to look a lot like grid view, right, where you've got a subject ID, you've got gender, and you've got a variable. So you can construct fam files on the fly using the cohorts uh, that you make in Transmart using just the standard subsetting we use to make any clinical cohort. You can rewrite the fam file and extract only the um, information from the binary file that's relevant to those subjects and run Plank. Um, why is this, why do, so I alluded to this earlier, why, you know, what does Transmart bring to the table for a geneticist? Why would they be interested in using this? Well, you know, the, the actual genetic analysis tool is fast and easy uh, to use, um, but what gets complicated for the geneticist is keeping track of the other data, right? The Plank data set only contains one column related to phenotype. It does not incorporate all of the information that we have on people. It certainly d doesn't tie in in any meaningful way to the gene expression profiles from the same patients. It doesn't tie in in any meaningful way to electronic health record data or uh, other clinical or demographic information about those, about those subjects. And certainly the um, sort of interrogative nature of the way um, uh, GWAS analysis is typically executed where, you know, it's a hypothesis-driven series of experiments, right? We have, for the last couple of years in Transmart, um, had the magic data set as our playground for um, practicing and trying to understand how to use Plink. They're all prefaced with the word magic. Well, that was one real uh, set of data from which many, many different hypotheses were asked. And each of those hypotheses produce a different association file, which is tied to the magic data set. So it's really nice from a, the perspective of the geneticist to have a study and to be able to store all the demographic information in one place, have those subsetting tools to facilitate a rapid sort of interrogation of one hypothesis after another in, in the Transmart interface, and then having the facility through the Pfizer workflow to be able to store those results immediately with the study that we're working with. So it's a really end-to-end -end solution for genetics. It allows them to organize their analyses. There's sort of a built-in way to tie all the data together. And I think, you know, for example, when we get to the point where we're able to make clinical cohorts based on gene expression profiles from the same subjects, we'll really begin to get the genetics community interested in using Transmart as the platform for running PLINK, for running Plink. Um, so the implementation, uh, what did we do? Um, it's pretty simple. We really only introduced one schema into Transmart. It's a single table and it's a very straightforward table. The binary data set is loaded as three blobs, the bed, the BIM, and the FAM file. The FAM file is kind of trivial in this case. It is important that it have the correct subject IDs in it, but we're gonna rewrite the FAM file for every analysis and every analysis we do. 
So when Plink is invoked, um, data's, the, the bed, BIM, and FAM files, well, the bed and BIM file are extracted from this and written to the application server in a folder on the application server. And the only caveat right now I would say if you're doing this at home is you, you need to um, make sure that your application server has, is, is um, uh, specced out with additional hard drive space to do this because each of these analyses create a new uh, Plink data set which is stored temporarily um, to provide you know, access to downloads of the data after the analysis. And so you have to think about trash collection on your server and making sure you clean it up occasionally so you don't eat up all the um, available space on the application server. Um, uh, when Plink is invoked, we constitute a new uh, FAM file, which is um, driven by the cohorts that are generated in the Transmart interface. And uh, only the information from the bed and BIM file that are relevant to those cohorts are copied to the application server. And then the, the analysis runs on the application server as a direct invocation of Plink. Although there is an R interface to Plink, we've just, we just run it directly. Um, so what we do when we load a Plink data set is we extract all the information from the existing FAM file. Um, so down here, um, you know, the family identifier, maternal, paternal identifier, the gender information is tied directly in the FAM file that comes from, typically from a client. And then there will be at least one variable, which is, you know, the, the sort of case control status. Um, but of course, you can fill out the rest of the tree with whatever clinical data is available. Uh, in this case, uh, HapMap was uh, sort of the uh, NIH's um, pre-runner to the Thousand Genomes project. And in HapMap, they, they set up all these uh, sort of ethnic uh, groups, and then they, 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 they basically collected GWAS information. They did uh, genotyping of a million or more polymorphisms in each of these groups. And you can get still, even though this data is like 15 years old now, you can still find the P-Link data sets on the NIH website for each of these cohorts. Uh, we just went in and grabbed six of them, um, consolidated them into a single data set, made a clinical variable for cohort um, so that you could look at any individual cohort if you want. Now this is really where Transmart becomes interesting. You know, to do this, I, I could very easily compare the African-American Southwest group with the Japanese cohort just by making in Transmart, you know, subset one and subset two, and maybe limit it to people under 50 or something. And it would take seconds to generate that core and run Plink. If you were a geneticist trying to work with this data, it's, you know, it's quite a bit of work to organize the Plink data set, extract the correct subjects, make a file with the subject IDs, and then run sort of script to do that. It's just a much more facile way to interact with the data. Um, Okay, and so, uh, and so um, the uh, Plink workflow contains a, a new uh, analysis type in the uh, um, advanced workflow pull-down menu uh, where you can specify some analysis name if you want. You can pick the kind of a type, the, the type of the analysis that you want to do. So the one that I've talked about mostly in this talk is the basic association test where you just define a subset with a control case and, and you run uh, Plink. Uh, you can define uh, some sort of threshold for acceptable p-values to write to the association result file. Uh, just like a marker selection workflow, you can limit the number of rows that you would see in the interface. Um, we're, this, this box is still in beta. We're not talking about that today. And uh, click Run. And, um, and, and what you get is, just like uh, what I showed earlier, you get some output, which is a, a p-value sorted list of the SNPs and their positions uh, within the genome from top to bottom, most associated to least associated. And you know, down at the bottom of this page, you'll find a, the download R data link, which will give you a folder containing the full association file along with any other files that may be relevant to downstream analysis. And this is really where you know, the, the, the existing GWAS workflows start, right? They, they pick up with this association file, which you upload and can view with Manhattan Plot Viewer. Um, yeah, so it's been validated. You know, I mean, we it, we know we know that this is going to work because we you know we're basically running the same uh, executable through two different interfaces. But yeah, if you run it in the Transmart instance, the sorted file you get is exactly the same as you get if you run it from the command line. Um, the, the order of SNP IDs is the same, and the probabilities are all the same. 
Um, you can also do other kinds of analysis. So you can do a logistic regression um, with covariates. So you, if you have variables that you know covary with your phenotype of interest and you want to extract that effect from your analysis, you can specify one or more covariates. Uh, you can do the same with linear regression. That would be another option here where you, rather than use a case control, you would have a single variable in subset one, like age or temperature or age of onset or you know whatever you want, some any numeric variable, and it will run a linear reg uh, regression rather than a logistic regression. Uh, but the, uh, the data output looks exactly the same in all these cases. All right, so what's needed? Uh, what are we integrating in 16.2? Well, there's a, a new module which gets um, compiled with Transmart uh, to produce the new workflow in the advanced uh, analytics uh, pull-down menu. There is a single new schema with five elements, three of which are blobs. And um, uh, the, our, our ETL tool, TM Data Loader, has been modified so that it knows what to do with this kind of variant data on, on upload. All right, and so I just want to emphasize again that you know, the, uh, the workflow that exists now starts with the output of what we produce. So this really pr produces a kind of end-to-end -end workflow for users working with uh, GWAS variants. Um, it leverages the uh, cohort formation facilities in Transmart to, um, to you know, ease the workflow for people doing this kind of analysis. It produces a file that can be visualized with Manhattan uh, viewer that, um, uh, that Pfizer's uh, responsible for bringing to us. And um, yeah, so it complements existing workflows. And I guess that's where I'll stop. If there are any questions, maybe we can hold them for the, for the panel. Yeah.